Okay, I'm back, and uh, this is Michael Tesmer. I am the safety services manager here uh, with uh, Wesco Safety, um, and uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, the new silica standard, uh, specifically more for construction. Um, I actually work for Connie Safety. We're a division of, of Wesco, and we are the safety services and safety team branch of Wesco. And uh, so we'll um, spend the next hour talking about this new standard. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have another webinar coming up uh, that's geared a little bit more towards general industry as we see the demand for that. Our focus today will be on construction. Um, so moving forward. So, Background on this standard, approximately 2 million construction workers are affected by the standard versus uh, about 300,000 workers in general industry. And uh, this, is, this is pretty important because if you, if you think about it, um, pretty much uh, everybody and most all uh, employers and their employees in the construction trades are probably affected in some way with uh, the silica dust standard. So that certainly um, that certainly is an important comment to make about that. Uh, and this, what it really comes down to is this permissible exposure limit for silica. And so basically what happened is OSHA lowered uh, the allowable level of silica dust, of respirable crystalline silica dust. So it's not just the total dust, but it's actually uh, the respirable uh, portion of crystalline silica dust and they lowered it, it to 50 micrograms uh, per meter cubed as an eight-hour time weighted average um, and that's pretty uh, significant when you think about the fact that in the and when you look at the construction industry this has been lowered by about five-fold or five times and for general industry it was basically cut in half um, as for the action level, the action level is half that amount at 25 micrograms uh, per meter cubed. And that's an important term to remember because the, the, the word action level means at when an employer must take action uh, regarding the standard. And if you can, uh, through air testing and proper documentation, if you as a, uh, a facility can stay below the action level, then the standard really doesn't apply to you. And that's it's that simple, that if you can have that documentation that you're below that, you, you no longer have to continue with, um, with objective data or looking at air monitoring and looking at the, the various options of complying with the standard as long as you stay below that limit. So um, we talk about, uh, um, you know, exposure versus hazard and think of an exposure as some level of intensity so anything over zero is an exposure and certainly uh, a hazard would exist when you're above uh, the recommended statutory limits and I put that number at the bottom of the page for, for you to understand that that 50 micrograms that funny little u-shape is basically uh, the same as saying 0 0.05 milligrams per meter cube. So again, a microgram is a thousand times smaller than a milligram. So we're talking a, a significantly tiny amount of dust. And, and, and basically, I, I hate to be so blunt. If you can see, as an example, if somebody is cutting or drilling or grinding on concrete. I'll use concrete as an example. If you can see that dust visibly in the air, there's a very good chance you're going to be over the exposure limit. So keep that in mind. And I've actually, unfortunately, have heard stories of people that have used engineering controls and wetting methods, and, and they didn't see any visible dust, and they still found they were slightly above the limit. So just, just be aware. We're talking about a very small amount of dust uh, that you're only allowed to breathe up to without... Um, needing proper protection or engineering controls. Um, also, you know, you, you do need air monitoring, uh, you, you know, with this, with this standard, you do need air monitoring results or looking at objective data to really confirm you're staying below that action level of 25 micrograms per meter cubed. And uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, information you have to gather to make sure you're, you're below that below that action level so keep that in mind okay so 
what you breathe in a day. If you look at this guy standing in this uh, this cube, if you will, uh, this is a neat visual reference, and uh, he's standing in the middle of a 16.8 meter cube. That represents the quantity of air inhaled during an eight-hour workday. So if we look at, you know, from an industrial hygiene standpoint, that uh, the average uh, adult worker breathes approximately 35 liters of air a minute. That's 2,100 liters an hour. And you multiply that by eight hours, that's 16,800 uh, 16, liters or 16.8 cubic meters of air in a day. And that's uh, roughly what we're looking at with that. That little photo by the penny uh, represents how much respirable crystal and silica dust you're allowed to breathe over a course of an eight hour day at what point you would be over the limit. So a very, very tiny minuscule amount. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little scary. And in terms of looking at just one particle of respirable crystalline silica, you wouldn't even be able to see it. It's, I believe, I think they've expressed it as being about 10 times smaller than what the, uh, uh, than what the human eye can even see. Um, so, uh, and, and respirable dust starts at about 40 microns in size. So, um, it, it, it's, you know, um, we got to remember too that most construction material on a job site uh, contains elements other than silica. So when we're looking strictly at at silica uh, and crystalline silica, it's really going to be important to know what you're dealing with. And we're going to talk a little bit about this as we go through this presentation. But just let's take concrete as an example. I mean, that's a a classic example where. Um, you know, there it, it really varies across the country in terms of how much uh, silica uh, is in even concrete. I think it can vary anywhere from five to forty percent across the United States. So it's really important to realize that. Uh, on this particular slide, I'm showing you uh, just this is something I googled, and just to show you that there there's a lot of good videos out there to help with your training and education of your employees and. Uh, um, you know, I, I just want you to be aware of that, like this very first one at the top, silica uh, exposure is a short little uh, three, four minute video that really hits home with what is it doing to your lungs and how is it getting in there and um, how, how is it affecting you? Uh, but uh, the, the, the point of the matter is, is silicosis is the one big concern of, uh, of, of what we're dealing with. And what happens is the, that Inside, deep inside of our lung, we have macrophases, which are uh, deep within the bronchial. Um, and, and what it does is they, they engulf these crystalline silica crystals and they try to dissolve them. And what ends up happening is these macrophases kind of go into the lung tissue um, and die. And, and it basically embeds this crystalline silica deep within the lung tissue. So we end up with scarring of the lungs. And that's one of the problems with silicosis is the scarring of the lungs and it affects how you breathe. And so there's a lot of good videos that talk about this and some of the hazards with this. And let's be honest, we've all been exposed to crystalline silica at some point in our life. If we just think about driving down the highway in the summer months of road construction and think of those clouds of dust that have been going across the roadway, uh, entering maybe into your car and you've been breathing that and, and it's, you know, so you have a certain amount of that crystalline silica you've already breathed. And again, a very little bit is not gonna cause much scarring, but it's these people that are exposed to this day in and day out at the, in, in the factory, on the construction job site that we're very much worried about. And this is a big deal. So this is a very busy slide and I, I apologize for that, uh, but uh, it, uh, it just kind of goes to show you the particle size and you can see that um, uh, respirable dust generally starts at about that four uh, micrometer particle size and, 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 and further down. And, uh, you know, you got, you got, in, you got dust that you can breathe and you can inhale dust, but for the most part, our lungs and our, our nostrils and the hairs in our nose, and there's all sorts of mechanisms that block out these larger particles from getting deep within the lung. But we're, we're really worried about these very tiny 
respirable particles, uh, specifically of respirable crystalline silica. Um, so, so keep that in mind that that's, that's all part of that. So uh, what are common work practices that cause the silica exposure? And I, I, I just like to analyze this in thinking of any time workers are cutting grinding or drilling on some of the following materials. And it's just not concrete. I mean, it can go beyond that. You can talk about ceramic and porcelain tile, uh, masonry blocks, clay and roof tiles, natural stone. I mean, I mean, if you're talking granite and some of these, some of the, the countertops that people cut into, that, that can be close to 100% crystalline silica. Uh, asphalt, even blacktop has got a certain amount of it in it. Um, so, so just kind of keep that in mind that each of these activities could potentially expose workers as much as 10 to 200 times above the OSHA PEL if you're not doing anything about it. So let's be clear, this standard is really uh, about, it's not about just putting a respirator on an employee. This is about OSHA saying, hey, let's try to address this by controlling the dust through generally engineering controls. And uh, the best methods for doing that is either wetting down the dust so it does not become airborne or by vacuum or ventilation systems that can control that into some sort of a high efficiency vacuum or some ventilation system. Got to remember, respirators, and OSHA looks at this in a lot of different industries, is more of a last resort. And yes, there are going to be situations that you will still need to wear respirators for certain activities. And I could argue that there is going to be a higher occurrence of people needing to be fit tested and clean shaven and wearing respirators because of the unknowns and because of, you know, until you get things figured out, you, you're better off to protect the workers and make sure they're not being overexposed. So I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Silicosis, we talked about that being one of the big uh, hot issues with it is uh, it can, it, you know, if we talk about chronic or classic silicosis, it can can occur after 15 to 20 years of just moderate to low exposures of, of crystalline silica. So that is certainly a, a very important thing to keep in mind that it, it's people that are affected by this over time. Accelerated silicosis and then yes, even acute silicosis that could occur even within a few months it's extremely high concentrations. And we think back to the 1930s and there's some short little videos. The government knew about this problem back in the 30s. And there were people, you know, with all the highway projects and uh, cutting into tunnels into the side of mountains. And people were literally getting silicosis within a couple months and dying within a, a few years of this horrible uh, respiratory disease. And, and um, it's unfortunately taken this long to finally be addressed in, in, with OSHA and the government and coming down with some, uh, some guidelines to keep our workers safer. And so, yes, this is going to be an expense and a burden to our, our employers and employees out there, but it's, it's very important that uh, we keep our construction workers safe. So we, we, talked, um, we talked about, uh, you know, silicosis, but certainly, um, you know, that's, that's just uh, one of the things that, that are involved with this, but, uh, uh, you know, you can still get lung cancer. I mean, lung cancer is because, you know, your, your lungs and your immune system are compromised and you're more susceptible to some of the problems related with cancer. And, and also you're more susceptible to lung infections like tuberculosis, which is a bacterial disease. So that's another thing to worry about. The kidneys, there's also a, a link between crystalline silica exposure and kidney disease, including nephritis, which is an inflammation and uh, of the kidney and end-stage renal disease. Um, the immune system being affected, again, your, your body's compromised and, uh, you know, and so that, that's just something else we gotta, we gotta be worried about. So in a nutshell, with this new standard, OSHA is looking at uh, three exposure control methods uh, that are used to help our employees deal with this problem, uh, to help, help make sure we're not exposing people above the permissible exposure limit that we talked about and, and even the action level, if that be the case. 
The easiest and most simplest approach to the standard is to follow table one. And that's going to be the first thing we're going to talk about. Um, but uh, uh, self-monitoring program, which is involving scheduled monitoring, where you're, you're, you're looking at different uh, occupations and, and different worker segment groups and what they're being exposed to and, and air testing samples. You don't have to sample every single employee at your facility, but you do have to do air testing for key people in, in different groups that have the highest potential of exposure. And then the very, very controversial objective data, which uh, some people are going to have a hard time uh, with this concept, that this is a lot of unknowns at this point with objective data, but objective data uh, might mean that you're uh, using information um, of, of air testing done from pre previous job sites. Maybe you're getting objective data from a, a tool manufacturer that, hey, if I purchase this Milwaukee drill and use their vacuum system, in a laboratory setting or in a controlled environment, if you will, we, we use this drill and drilled these holes and we use the dust extraction system and it kept the amount of silica dust below the exposure limit. That's, that's an example of objective data that could be used. But in a perfect world, table one is what we're going to be looking at first. So if you look, uh, the OSHA standard, and obviously I encourage everybody to read through the standard, but they list 18 common construction activities that they have um, listed that if you follow the requirements in this standard, uh, you, you do not have to worry about anything further. You just have to follow exactly what they state in the standard. And that's, that's what uh, Table 1 is all involved with. And there all sorts of different activities. Some of these are more common than others. Uh, when we think of uh, handheld power saws and uh, drills and jackhammers and chipping tools and things like that, grinding. Yes, sometimes you have to grind if you got raised surfaces of concrete. Uh, uh, an employee on a, uh, at a contractor might have to grind down the concrete. And, it, and again, this stuff creates an enormous amount of dust. And how are you going to control that? And this table will talk about that. So this, this slide here is right out of the standard. And it goes through, if you look at the far left column, it, it lists them uh, Roman num numeral wise, the different activities. And if you can... Fit, uh, fit the niche of this, and if you follow this exactly, um, you are in compliance with the standard. So, as an example, um, you know you can see stationary masonry saws, and it says that if you use in the second column, engineering and work practice control, if you use the saw equipped with an integrated water delivery system that continuously feeds water to the blade. You operate it in accordance to the manufacturer's instruction, then you work over to the far right-hand columns. If you're doing this work less than four hours per shift, no respirator is needed. And then if you're doing it greater than four hours, no respirator is needed. So the, just, again, they're not saying a vacuum system. This is a water delivery system. So Here's a photo on the uh, left side of the page of uh, a typical masonry saw without any water. This is how dusty it gets. This is how bad it gets to the employee breathing in that silica dust. Um, you know, regardless of them wearing a respirator, that's not the right approach. They want, if you're going to follow table one, you use water and it controls the dust. And they're saying you could do this all day. You don't have to wear a respirator. You don't have to do air testing. No other documentation is needed, but you should put that in part of your written program. Okay, so here's another example. Here's a hand, here's number two, handheld power saw. And it says here that if you use, uh, um, again, with an integrated water delivery system, and it says when used outdoors, you don't need a respirator if it's less than four hours. However, when used indoors or in an enclosed area for less than four hours, it says APF 10. That's an assigned protection factor of 10 on a respirator. And for those that aren't, aren't understanding that, that's, you know, most safety people know that. That just means you want to wear a respirator that has a protection factor of 10. And it can be an N95. So it could literally be a disposable 
N95 respirator that the employee was fit tested, trained, clean shaven. You got a respirator program. You could use a half mask respirator with N95 filters. You could put P100 filters on it or what some people refer to as HEPA filters. The, the point is you don't need that high efficiency of a filter. They just want you to wear a respirator and that the employee has been trained, fit tested, <clears throat> had a medical evaluation to verify that they're, they're fit to wear that respirator. So photo at the top left <clears throat> is an example of a steel uh, saw it and blades missing on that. But uh, just to show you, it's a handheld uh, power saw, if you will, with a water delivery system. It looks like uh, basically a Hudson sprayer that you pump up and it mists water onto the sprayer like you see on the far right side of the page. Okay, and that controls the dust. One more example. We're going up to example number 11 here. Ha Handheld grinders for mortar removal or what they call tuck pointing. And here now they're saying instead of using a water delivery method, they're using a grinder equipped with a shroud and a dust collection system. And the key with this, if you look at the third paragraph, is the dust collector must provide 25 cubic feet per minute or greater of airflow per each wheel, inch of wheel diameter. So if you got a four inch wheel on uh, one of these tuck pointers, you, you know, do the math, four times 25, you just gotta have an airflow of 100 CFM to the vacuum system. And even when you're using this dust collection system, you can see very clearly, you still have to have an assigned protection factor of 10 for less than four hours and greater than four hours assigned protection factor 25. So now you're getting out of, if it's more than a four hour work shift, you're getting out of the half mask air purifying respirators and you might even be into like a, a, an airline system or a full face respirator with filters if you've been quantitatively fit tested. So here's a photo of a worker <clears throat> who happens to be in, uh, doing tuck pointing on 30% crystalline silica quartz, which is a little bit higher. Uh, remember we said crystalline silica in mortar and concrete generally ranges somewhere between five to 40%. Uh, quite amount of dust. And if you notice deeper uh, within the scaffold there, there's another worker there who's in a cloud of dust as well. So there's actually two workers up there and you can actually see that he's actually wearing a respirator, but you know, keep in mind, this was 10 years ago. This was before the standard. So they, you know, the employer thought that, well, I'm protecting my employees. I got a respirator on them. It is what it is. But look at the page when we brought the employee down on, onto the ground. So he was wearing a half mask respirator. And if you see the filters at the top left of the page, whenever you see a pink, purple, or magenta filter, those are referred to as <clears throat> P100 filters, and that's a high efficiency filter. So certainly very appropriate, but generally speaking, you can only get an assigned protection factor or that APF of 10. It doesn't go any higher than that. So if they're doing tuck pointing all day, that filter would not be appropriate anyways uh, for over the course of an eight hour day. Plus they're wanting to use a vacuum system which would control most of the dust. Now, look at the photo to the top right of the page and you'll notice inside the mass, there's quite a bit of fine silica dust in there or concrete dust, whatever you wanna call it. There's dust in there and how do you think that dust is getting into his mask? So you go to the bottom of the page and yes, uh, it's quite obvious this guy's got a beard and you cannot wear a tight fitting face piece respirator with a beard. So this guy would have to be clean shaven in order to pass a fit test that's not even allowed. So if anything, I could argue as a safety professional that he's basically, it's almost as if he's not even wearing anything because that, that fine dust is just filtering right through his beard and getting into the mask and causing problems. So not a good scenario here. So just keep that in mind. That's a big deal uh, going forward is now you may have employees that you may need to put into respirators that may have had a beard for many years and they're not gonna be too happy about shaving that beard, but that, that might have to be a reality. Otherwise, you may have to put them into a more expensive powered air purifying respirator or supplied air hood system or something. So just, there are options out there. And again, I, I'm, 
I may run out of time at the end of this to answer any questions, so I want to make sure I'll have my email and you can call me if we need to talk about this a little bit further. If I get a chance to answer a couple questions at the end, I'll try to do so. Otherwise, I, I want to encourage you to either email me or call me and we can help you out a little further beyond this. So. So moving on, self-monitoring program. So this is, uh, now we're getting into how OSHA would want you to kind of confirm where you're at. If you're not able to follow table one, you're gonna look at a self-monitoring program. And so this is right out of the standard. I hate to be all wordy with you about this, but uh, if you look at number two, it says exposure assessment. The employer shall assess the exposure of each employee who may, who is or may reasonably be expected to be exposed to the respirable crystalline silica at or above the action level. Not just the PEL, but just above the action level. You have to assess that. Now, if I got five guys doing the same work on the job site and they're somewhat equally exposed, well, I don't have to test all five people. Maybe as an employer, I'm only gonna test one or two and kind of use that as my guideline. So you, you can you can kind of get a representative sample of that, okay? So again, if you're not using table one, you go into the scheduled monitoring option, um, you're trying to get uh, initial monitoring to assess the eight hour time weighted average. Now you may say, well, my, my worker doesn't uh, work a full eight hours in the silica. Well, it doesn't matter if he's working there for three hours, you, you, you still, you test for that and, and you can calculate that over an eight hour day, but generally speaking, you wanna leave the pump running that if they're still on the job site, there still could be residual dust in the air away from where the grinding and cutting and drilling is occurring, you let the pump generally run for the eight hour day. That's not to say you don't, you can't do a shorter test, you can, but then they would try to extrapolate that over the course of an eight hour day and you'd have to assure that they were not having any exposure for the rest of that six hours as an example of the day they weren't working. So again, if you've never done air testing, you know, the, you just can't, buy these pumps or rent them without a little bit of training and knowledge on this. So don't, that's not what this one hour overview is about, but just be aware of that. So, so keep that in mind. Um, at the very bottom of this page, it says performance option and it says the employer shall assess the eight hour time weighted average for each employee on the basis of, or of any combination of air monitoring data or objective data sufficient to accurately characterize that employee's exposure to that respirable crystalline silica. So that's where objective data comes into play. So it, for people that are trying to avoid air monitoring, they may be looking to find objective data, but boy, there's a lot of unknowns there. And how do you know that somebody else's air monitoring data pertains to what you got going on on your job site? So just be careful with that. But back to scheduled monitoring, here's kind of the prescription of what they're suggesting for the different work activities. So if you initially put air sampling pumps on your workers and they, they're they sampling for silica dust, and if your initial readings on that employee is below the action level, no additional monitoring has to be done. You can say, hey, uh, my that employee that with the tasks he does is below that level, so don't have to do any more monitoring. As long as you can unsubstantially, you know, you gotta be careful to know that that work does not change from job site to job site. So that might be real easy to do in a factory environment or where the worker's job activities never change, but if the job activities change, you may have to do some more air testing. Then if you look at some of the other dashes here, it says if your most recent result was at or above the action level, then they want you to repeat the air testing every six months. If you're at or above the permissible exposure limit, you gotta repeat even frequently. And all these other criteria, so they're telling you how frequently you have to do this air testing on the different segments of your work group. So, so Appendix A of the standard has different uh, methods for uh, sampling. Uh, six, I think, uh, six approved methods that are used by the laboratory for testing for crystalline, uh, respirable crystalline silica. 
Compliance with the appropriate test methods has to be done by June 23rd of 2018. And I just wanted to show you the photo at the top left is just showing a, a calibrator that's a, a type of a dry calibrator, and he's calibrating the pump. He's making sure the pump is at the flow rate it's supposed to be at, and you're supposed to recalibrate that at the end of the, the sampling shift. The photo at the right shows an employee wearing a pump and wearing what's called what I call a cyclone. It's a filter cassette at the top, and that little weird narrow tube below that filter cassette is a cyclone, and it's designed to spin the air to get the larger particles out of the sample, because we're worried about those tiny uh, respirable crystal and silica dust that you might breathe deep within your lungs, and that's what's being captured on that filter cassette. So that's what that's all about. And that's one of the techniques that are out there. So here's some ex other examples of pictures of different cyclones. And they kind of go up in size. They're different sizes because as you get to these bigger, heavier, clunkier cyclones, they have faster flow rates on the pump. And you don't have to sample for the whole eight-hour shift as an example. Maybe the worker's only working for about an hour or two hours. Then you would you would only take that same, maybe you're only getting a sample for two hours, you're gonna need a faster working pump and you're gonna have to spin the air even quicker and et cetera, et cetera. So, and you're worried about, you know, it, you don't wanna overload the filter and all that. So there's all these different things you gotta worry about. Uh, but um, anyways, they got this new sampling protocol and uh, the second bullet item here, it says use uh, uh, analysis by either X-ray diffraction or infrared technology, that's the laboratory testing method and how, what they're doing uh, to help uh, verify this. Generally speaking, you're, you're sampling, you know, a lot of these traditional cyclones, you're sampling at 1.7 liters per minute. Um, and again, as I mentioned, if you're doing a very short sample, you might have to be sampling at eight, nine, liters per minute, you know, and so there's very strict protocols on how you have to do that. Um, so so kind of keep that in mind going forward here. Um, I, I really am excited about this technology. It's actually been out for a while, but this is called a parallel particulate impactor. This is a type of, of sample cassette that does not need that heavy, bulky cyclone. So if you are a company and you have to do air testing, you really should look at this technique of sample that you send to the lab. It still meets one of the NIOSH protocols for sampling, but the light tan colored one is set for two liters per minute, the orange one's at four liters, and the red one's at eight liters per minute. So it covers the whole gamut of whether you're doing a short sample period or a long. If you're doing a, a full eight hour shift, you'd use the two liter per minute sample media. You gotta have the right pump hooked up to it. You still gotta calibrate it, but the dust enters the top holes and, and the larger particles get blocked out from being trapped on the filter cassette. Very cool technique, very easy for the employees to wear, very easy for the industrial hygienist to deal with. You don't have to worry about dumping, uh, or worried about the orientation of the filter cassette when you're sampling. So there's a lot of positives with this type of a sampling technique. And it's important to make sure you keep the sample in the breathing zone. You gotta remember, we're trying to replicate what the employee's breathing, where he's walking throughout the day, and you know, even having it on the left shoulder versus the right shoulder, making sure it's up close near his breathing zone. These are all important factors in, in how we gather our samples. So as a sampler or as, as an industrial hygienist who puts these pumps on people, you, you, you wanna document what they were doing, how much they were cutting or grinding or drilling with the concrete, where were they working? Where did they take, when did they take their lunch break? When were they not exposed to silica that you could see so that when you get your results back, you can tie that into what the actual readings were and make sense of it. So a lot of, lot of work involved with this. And yes, there is some, quite a bit of cost with this. And that's one of the difficult things about the standard is if you have to do air testing, you know, um, it, it can be troublesome and you can, and, and, and you're gonna have to repeat some of the testing. Okay, you got to notify employees of the results within five working days um, after completing your exposure assessment and you got to have it in writing, notify them what's going on. So this is stuff right out of the standard. 
you know, and, and there's going to be situations where you're not going to be able to use possibly wetting methods or other engineering controls, vacuum systems. This guy is sandblasting and you really can't, you know, and that's what this little paragraph says is they realize there's some work activities where if the employer can demonstrate that those, those engineering controls are not feasible, um, you just got to make sure then that you do the best you can to reduce the exposure level the best you can, but make sure you got the correct respiratory protection. Now here's an employee who's sandblasting He's wearing the correct PPE and he's got an airline system. So he's got a very high level de degree of, of respiratory protection. But on the same token, there's a cloud of dust in this area. Where are the other workers? So you, you, you want to barricade this off and maybe you're using Visqueen to kind of keep other um, uh, contractors or other employees from entering this area. You're using signage. A big part of the standard is having a, a written exposure control plan and how are you handling that with other contractors and your own people keeping them out of potentially dangerous risky areas such as this would be in breathing this dust. So keep that in mind. There's, a, there's more to it than just the air testing involved here. So moving on, objective data. Topsy-turvy, because yes, this is a, a very debatable topic and I'm giving you my opinion, so you got to take this for what it's worth. I, I know there's going to be safety professionals and industrial hygienists that may not agree with some of the things I may talk about, but objective data is an option. And I know that in a perfect world, air monitoring should trump this, but objective data is a way that we think some employers are going to be looking at closely to help avoid all the expensive air monitoring out there because if they can use objective data from some other source to get their information, that would be helpful in keeping the cost down and, uh, and, and the labor involved with de de dealing with all the monitoring. So, so keep that in mind. Um, objective data, if you look at these bullet items, could include air monitoring data from industry-wide surveys or calculations based on the composition of the substance. So you need to kind of know what percentage of crystalline silica is in, say, the concrete you're working with, or how else can you use objective data? Because if your objective data from a plant in Texas was at 35% crystalline silica, and yet where you work, it's only 10% crystalline silica, you know, you're, you're going to have a much more conservative value, which is a good thing, but you, you just got to be careful with that. And that's what they say with the third bullet item is that you must, it must reflect workplace conditions closely resembling or with a higher exposure potential than the processes and control methods used at your facility. So, so take this to heart. This is really quite important in that regards. And again, this is right out of the standard. Here's an example. This, is, this little device here is called, um, it's a direct read respirable dust monitor. So this is one type of a technique that, that feasibly could be used to check for respirable crystalline silica dust. Now, you still would have to have some air testing done or sample testing done to know what is the percent of crystalline silica in the compound of the dust being generated. And I'm going to keep picking on concrete, but it could be stone or it could be uh, some sort of a mortar block or a, a roofing tile, or it could be blacktop. And, and if you have a safety data sheet, so HASCOM comes into place here, maybe the safety data sheet tells you how much uh, crystalline silica is in the product and and through formulas and, and that that information you can punch that into these digital direct read respirable dust monitors and you might be able to have a way to calculate or to maintain your program with a digital dust monitor now again just purchasing one of these and saying yep this is what i got isn't the answer because again it is registering not specifically to crystalline silica, it's registering anything that's considered respirable dust. So it's picking up all the dust. And so you need to know what fraction of that is that crystalline silica dust. So you got to kind of follow the manufacturer's guidelines on what they suggest. But this is one that here at Wesco we can rent 
for customers or, or we can sell them. You can, you know, but these things are expensive. I mean, I think these things can run upwards of, of 10 grand. And so renting them might be a more feasible option, but it is another possible uh, option for employers to consider to help with their program and to keep help keep some of the other costs down. So yeah, we talked about bulk samples and the amount of silica content on the material. And here, here's an example of a safety data sheet that I, I looked at uh, for, that came up for, if you look at the very bottom, it says sheetrock. So this is drywallers, people putting up uh, the joint compound and, and doing that uh, where they're blending the drywall on a new house construction. And, and that gets brought up. Is there silica in drywall? Well, there, there's a little bit in a lot, and it just depends on the drywall. But if, what they're saying is if you're using this joint compound, it says if you read that, and I apologize for the, um, the poor quality of the wording here. This is a scanned copy of a safety data sheet. It, it says raw materials in this product contain respirable crystalline silica as an impurity. The weight of this crystalline silica is less than 0.7%. The OSHA PEL uh, for respirable dust has been lowered to this number. It became effective June 23rd, 2016, with compliance dates out there. Um, testing of this product and its constituents suggest that under normal conditions, uh, the expected use of this product will not result in exposure above the OSHA PEL. However, actual exposures to respirable crystalline silica on any given job site must be determined by workplace hygiene testing. So here you got something that's less than 1% crystalline silica and, and the manufacturing ain't gonna stand behind it. They're gonna say, well, you're gonna have to still do some air testing to, to verify your employees are not over the level when you're in a house sanding on that drywall and creating, and you know that, they create clouds of dust when they're doing drywall work. How bad is it? And, and again, we just haven't seen enough objective data out there to know where we stand on some of these different job scenarios. So keep that in mind. I mentioned uh, tool manufacturers. Here's, here's an example, uh, one of the vendors we work with at Wesco Milwaukee Tool. They're saying, hey, if you, if you purchase our drill and our vacuum system, we'll give you this data sheet. And we have this data sheet that says that if you drill holes, um, over the course of an hour and they try to do worst case scenario and they'll drill with different size drill bits and different uh, depths of the hole and they're very clear and it's a very scientific way of doing objective data. They're saying our dust uh, extraction system uh, and, now, and they tell you how much percentage of crystalline silica is in the, the concrete that they tested and using our drill with our uh, vacuum system you'll be below the action level. So that would be objective data you could use to document that you are keeping your employees safe and below the level. So that's an example of objective data. I just wanted to show you. So there are techniques out there for that. So this is a, a alternative exposure control methods. We talk about the hierarchy of controls and we, we mentioned this, that this applies to a lot of work scenarios. OSHA looks at this a lot that, hey, the most effective way to deal with a hazard is to eliminate it. We get it. Yeah. And that's true with silica. If you, if you don't have to be using silica in, in, in your process, um, then yeah, eliminate it or, or lower it or substitute it. So it was, we worked on the list, substitution. The bulk of this standard is engineering controls. And that's where, again, we're using wetting methods. We're using ventilation and vacuum systems to engineer out the problem. We know we have silica dust uh, in different construction activities. Now, how do we control it uh, outside of just putting on a respirator? Administrative controls, I think of that as uh, maybe job rotations and, and, and change the way people work. Do you have to have your face right down into the grinder when you're grinding? Can you step back a little bit? Or is there a way to, uh, you know, can you keep some of the people out of that area that don't need to work right at that moment you're grinding? So it's job rotations and control of the people. And then last but not least, the hierarchy of controls is PPE. OSHA never wants you just to slap a respirator on somebody. That's supposed to be the last resort. You know, the reality is, yes, at Wesco Safety and Connie Safety here, we sell respirators and we know they're, you know, people are buying more 
respirators because of the standard, and that's just the honest fact about it, is that sometimes you can do some of these engineering controls, but there are going to be some unusual situations that you better be prepared to have your people potentially have to wear a respirator, and that might be the truth of it. And they better not have a full beard because that could that could be a problem. You know, have you gone through and fit tested and and uh, trained them and medically evaluated? Do you have a written respirator program? Because I, I I can positively assure you it's probably going to crop up at some point that you wish you would have done that ahead of time and been prepared for that. Don't just treat it as, oh, I have respirators available that if the employees want to wear them, they can put it on. Because that's voluntary and that's a little different scenario. That's knowing you are below the allowable exposure level. So just be careful with that. Other ways to reduce exposure, we barrier tape, just blocking off the area, putting up signage, keeping people out of the area. That's one of those uh, administrative controls we were talking about. Uh, putting up visqueen or, or you know, ways to can keep that dust from leaving the area that they're they're doing the grinding in. But ultimately, you you still got to figure out a way to uh, readapt some of the tools you have. I mean, you you should be looking at vacuum systems and wetting methods because that's really ultimately what you need to be doing how how can it even if that means having another employee standing there with a hudson water sprayer and spraying while that guy's jackhammering because if you didn't decide not to pay the money to get that special add-on adapter with the water spray nozzles and all that well then you're gonna have to have somebody a helper or somebody standing there spraying it to keep that dust down and that might be part of it as well so five additional key components to the standard I just want to briefly hit on. Uh, we got about 15 minutes in our presentation, and, and I just want to hit on these things, written exposure control plan. So we're going to start with that one. And yes, you do have to have a written exposure control plan on every job you go to. Now, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of times they, these exposure control plans can be adaptable and tweak to go from one job to the next. It's going to be a lot easier for, for general industry, people where the job doesn't change, but for construction, it may change a little bit. You need to describe the tasks that involve where people might be exposed to silica. What are the engineering controls and work practices and, and maybe even respirators for each task? Documenting the housekeeping measures to limit the exposure. Now, housekeeping measures are important because that's a big topic. So you got a lot of this concrete dust. Oh, we just take a air hose and blow it off. No, that ain't going to happen anymore. So the, the days of taking compressed air, dry sweeping, that's gone with concrete dust. You can't just sweep it away because you're creating more clouds of dust. So we'll, we'll talk about that briefly uh, going forward. And you got to have a competent person who makes frequent and regular inspections on the job site uh, to implement that written con exposure control plan. So, so f the first thing out of the out of the gate, you have to identify somebody on your job. Say, if if you don't have a safety person there, is it the foreman? Is it the supervisor? Who is going to be identified as the competent person? And they better understand what that means, and and probably should have had had some training to to be that competent person. So written exposure control plans, I'm, I'm, I'm big on the fact that why reinvent the wheel? Don't make this harder than it has to be. Here's a, here's a website, and, I, and you can see it right at the very bottom of the page, www.silica-safe.org. This is a really cool website uh, just dedicated for the protection of workers dealing with silica. And they have, if you look off to the right, create a plan. And you can create your own written exposure control plan for your job by just following the steps with this. So they're they're out there. You, you know, we do have paid services and, and and things like that that can help you with this. But there there are a lot of free things out there as well. Silica competent person. We talked about that. That's an individual capable of identifying existing and foreseeable hazards of silica and who has the authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate or minimize those hazards. So it has to be somebody that has a little authority to tell somebody, hey, you're not doing this correctly, or they're, they're making sure they're going to the job before it gets started and making sure they're identifying the hazards. They're, they're very well aware of the written exposure control plan. They have the ability to implement it. 
Uh, they, they have to make, be able to make frequent and regular inspections of the job site. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is the very first health standard to require the use of a competent person. We, we as a safety trainer, I use the word competent person in a lot of things I teach. We, I do competent person fall protection training. There's a competent person I teach with trenching and excavation. So it's used out there, but this is the first time it's been used for a health standard. And again, we really feel, and I've heard this, the, the hazards of crystalline silica are every bit as bad as asbestos was. And think of how much of a headache that was in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s of what people had to go through with all that. That This is just as bad. And, and yet it, we, we got to treat it as such and we got to be really mindful of that. The employees on the job site must be able to identify that competent person on that given day. It is critical. So if you ever had an OSHA inspection, that's really important. And again, some more bullet items uh, talking about the competent person, um, wh what they, what they got to do, anticipate the potential for exposure, make the initial evaluation. Just kind of recap of what we talked about. Okay. The standard actually does even make reference to a qualified person, which is, a, I, I would focus more on the competent person, but there, there is something that they mentioned talking about the, the silica qualified person who has a recognized degree. It might be the corporate safety director, um, but again, that's not somebody that has to be out on the job site on a regular basis or anything like that. Uh, but the competent person is really much more critical. And when I look at, you got to remember with this standard back in, um, it was uh, late October, OSHA came out with their interim enforcement guidance for respirable crystalline silica. And that's how they were going to go interimly, how they were going to enforce the standard. And, and, and it's available online and you can look at it. It's only, I think it's only like 13, 14 pages long. And it tells how the compliance inspector, how to go to that job site and inspect them and what they're looking for. And one of the, uh, the things to keep in mind is there's nowhere in their inspection process that they talk about the qualified person. It's all about the competent person. And that's the first thing they're going to say is, who's your competent person on this job site? And, and it's so funny because the very first thing they say to the, the compliance officer at the very beginning is, um, be prepared um, to collect personal breathing zone samples on the first day in the inspection, period. That's the very first bullet item on their objectives. Uh, so keep that in mind that if they're questioning something, they're going to do air sampling to verify that you're, you're in compliance. Medical surveillance. This is a tough one. So if you expect that employees would be required to wear a respirator for 30 days or more per year based on whether you're following table one, whether you're using uh, air monitoring or objective data, it doesn't matter. And keep in mind, wearing a respirator for one day means five minutes. If you, if I have to make one of my employees put on a respirator because they drilled two holes and it took them five minutes, that is is constitutes one day of wearing a respirator. So for 30 days or more per year, that institutes the medical surveillance. And, and it's really important to understand what this means. So um, medical surveillance is far more important in terms of the complexity of it than a medical evaluation. So anybody that has to wear a respirator that is required by the employer to wear a respirator has to do what's called a medical evaluation. That's different than medical surveillance. So a medical eval could simply mean going online, and we have it at Wesco and through Connie here, is we can go onto the 3M website through our portal, and uh, an employer would pay $29, and their employee would take an, uh, just a brief questionnaire asking about their health history, and if they have not had a heart attack in the last few years or don't have a history of emphysema and blah, 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 the, the computer is smart enough to know that you passed that medical eval and you're ready to proceed with fit testing and the wearing of the respirator. That's an online medical evaluation and it, it's cheap and it's simple. It's in a way for a technique an approved technique from OSHA, by the way, that allows employers to allow people to 
get an indirect evaluation done that doesn't have to, you know, the employer would never know about their health history. They either passed it or they didn't pass it. However, with this new standard, medical surveillance, that gets a little bit more complicated. And, and to, that's where they, that if you know you have employees going 30 days or more a year wearing a respirator exposed to crystalline silica, you have to send them to a, uh, a um, uh, licensed healthcare practitioner. So either a physician or a licensed healthcare practitioner, it's generally $450 to, to get these type of full-blown physicals done. They're doing chest x-rays. They're doing a full physical exam. They're doing tuberculosis testing. They're doing spirometry tests, and you're repeating this every three years. So there's, there's a lot involved with these medical surveillances. You don't have to make the employee do it, but you have to offer it. And the only way to document offering it is to, um, you know, you, you get them to sign a waiver if they decide they don't want to do it. So I, I, I show that here on another slide here. And I, we call this a declination form. And, and I know you're, you're, you're reading this and saying, oh, this is a hepatitis B declination form. Yeah, it, it is. But this is an example of what you could do because, um, if you look at the uh, bloodborne pathogen standard that's commonly used, you know, people get trained in that in healthcare. There's a lot of people in healthcare that that do not want to get a hepatitis B vaccine. And this is an example of a declination statement that the employee would sign saying, yeah, I, I get that I'm being offered this hep, hep B vaccination. I don't want that. And, and they can sign off on it and do that. And so you could use this as a, as a template, if you will, for refusing medical surveillance for uh, respirable crystalline silica. So I just wanted to point that out, that this is a, my way of showing you an example. So respirators, as we mentioned, that, that there are going to be situations where even following table one, you may still have to wear a respirator. The minimum level of protection is called an N95. That's a, th that product you see on the left side of the page that is a NIOSH approved respirator that if you are properly fit tested with that respirator, you can go up to 10 times over the OSHA permissible exposure level for dust, fumes, and mists. So in the case of respirable crystalline silica, you can go up to 10 times over the limit. Uh, the OSHA permissible exposure limit for crystalline silica is 0 0.05 milligrams per meter cubed, multiply that by 10, that means I could go up to 0.5 milligrams per meter cubed without you know, risk of exposure in theory. The problem is you shouldn't be breathing or being put in that situation of being at that high. But again, if you're following table one, this is an example of an assigned protection factor of 10. Likewise, the product on the right side of the page, which is a 3M half mask respirator that has removable filters on it, and you can change those filters. And I know, again, you're looking at those filters and they're pink. That is a higher efficiency filter, and you can put a lower efficiency filter on that. I could even argue that I prefer the cheaper uh, lower efficiency filter because it's easier to breathe through and a hardworking worker is going to strain more and these things plug up quicker on these higher rated P100 filters. So just be aware of that, that there is some legitimate reason to potentially select a lower rated filter, what we call the N95. So, uh, and I can talk to you further about that if you have any questions on that. I do think you're going to get a better fit with a mask uh, on the right side of the page because you can get those made out of silicone. They seem to just adhere to your face better than a traditional dust mask that you'd see on the left side of the page. So keep that in mind. Just be aware of that, that we, we get far better fit test pass rates with half mask than we do with disposables. Housekeeping. No more dry sweeping. They, they do allow you to wet the dust and still sweep it. No more air compressors. Um, you know, so there, there's techniques out there, but uh, they, in a perfect world, they'd rather you vacuum up the silica dust on the floor or lightly wet it, or you can even use what are called sweeping compounds. There are products we sell that you can sprinkle. They're an oily substance you sprinkle on the dust 
and then you can sweep it and it keeps the dust down. Be careful. You, you know, you don't want to just be taking an air compressor and blowing dust off your clothes. And so we sell these guard air devices that are little vacuum systems that you can vacuum the dust off of you. And there are very, very expensive ventilation systems on the right side of the page. You can look at these online. They're pretty cool, but you have to wear a respirator. You go into this chamber, you got goggles on, you hold your arms out and you get blown by this. It's like a hurricane in there. It's almost like a tornado in there. And it basically blows all the dust off your clothes. But you got to be wearing goggles goggles and you got to have a respirator on because it's going everywhere but it's basically vacuuming it and sucking it out at the bottom of the floor but pretty cool concepts but those are illegal as well training and record keeping remember this is a performance based standard osha believe it or not does not even require that you have a a set um curriculum of, of recording your training I just would advise you do train and you document it um, and this is what they say is they say each employee must demonstrate knowledge and understanding of at least the following uh, the health hazards the tasks they're doing uh, measures the employers has taken to protect them uh, who's the competent person the purpose of the medical surveillance program so these are basic things you have to make sure all your employees that are affected by the standard understand because they could be quizzed by OSHA on a, on a site. Um, we talked about HASCOM, making sure you got safety data sheets on the products. So yes, we're, we do need a safety data sheet on concrete <laughs> because if you are cutting, grinding, or drilling into it, that is a, a health hazard and you have to have a safety data sheet that documents it and your employees need to know where it's at. You're going to have to have signage, keeping people out of the area. Um, and again, going back to what we talked about, air monitoring data, you want to have record keeping on it, keeping good records on it, keeping track of your objective data if you use it, if there's any medical surveillance. And uh, I already mentioned, but I think it's ridiculous. The standard actually says, no, you're not, not required to maintain the, the training records, but you got you got to train the employees because how else are they going to learn about this. How else are they going to know what they're required to follow with? I would like to have training records on that, even though it's kind of ridiculous they forgot to put that in the standard. So so keep that in mind. Um, we're right at noon here, and I apologize. And I, I know uh, I'm just at the second to last slide, so hang, in, hang with me here. Um, keeping track of records here. Uh, understanding unique situations, and maybe you're in enclosed areas or confined spaces. Be aware of the different scenarios or extended work shifts, and you're, maybe you're using different high-powered tools, and how, how are we going to handle that? So that's where the competent person has got to be able to identify these situations where further evaluation might be needed. Okay, and, and the standard even talks about excavators and backhoes on construction sites and making sure you got an enclosed cab on there with a good filter and that the, it doesn't leak and, and things like that. So the, they're even looking at that and excavators and how they're handling that on construction job sites. And we talked about, yeah, again, how are you going to keep it off your clothes? And at the end of the day, you don't want to be taking your dusty silica-based clothing home with you and hugging your kids and your wife or whatever it might be. And I, I think it's really important to consider that do we need to be wearing disposable clothing at work or is there a way for an employee to uh, get this dust off of them prior to heading home or getting in their vehicle? So that's uh, something you really got to think about here. So with that said, I am Michael Tesmer. I'm part of the safety services team. I'm the safety services manager. I did leave my phone number and my uh, email address up here. You can even contact anybody in our safety services team. We're available to help with training uh, or just to answer your questions and, and know that uh, uh, a lot of this information we got from the, uh, you know, there's a good resource out there for small contractors called the Small Entity Compliance Guide. Uh, but just know that, uh, you know, our team is here to help you. Um, and uh, we at Wesco uh, Safety appreciate all your, your business. And uh, we want to be able to help you with all your safety needs. And, and uh, by all means, though, if there's anything I was not able to answer uh, in this presentation, you can either call me uh, or email me. And I'd be more than happy to talk to you further about it. So appreciate your time and have a good rest of your day. Take care. I know.